Good morning. Get quiet all of a sudden. Everybody's like, what happened? <laughs> morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to Bethel Assembly. Thank you all for being here on this New Year's Eve. Uh, we appreciate you coming. Uh, for those of you who are streaming, um, say hi to each other online there so we have a way of knowing uh, who all is here. Um, there is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read here. I missed all the announcements. Uh, glad you're here today. Uh, we're excited for what God has to do, uh, who's going to be doing with us today. Uh, Pastor Danny is away, and his wife are away on vacation, their family. Uh, we have Pastor Bill Gallus and his wife Mary who's with us again. We're excited to hear what God's going to uh, speak to us through his words today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, There's a verse that uh, kind of was on my heart this week. It's Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, we, we, we read this, and we've, we've heard this a number of times. Uh, through him, then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips, praising his name. And that's what we're going to be doing here in a minute or two, is, is offering praise from our lips to God. But that next verse, I think sometimes we forget, and it kind of ties in with everything that we've been doing here in the last few months. Uh, to offer up the fruit of our lips, praising his name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's not just a sacrifice of praise from our lips. Yes, we need to be doing that. But it's also obeying his command to love each other and to provide for each other and to love others as we love ourselves, right? That's, that's all part of it. So if you would stand with me, um, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to spend some time worshiping him today. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today, Lord, thanking you and praising you for who you are, Lord, for the things that you've done for us, the sacrifices that you've made. Lord, as we celebrate in this season that you, that you came to this earth, Lord, for the sole purpose of providing that sacrifice that we could not provide for ourselves, Lord, but you provided the sacrifice that would uh, enabled us, Lord, to come into your presence and to have a restored relationship with you. Father, we thank you for your glory, your majesty. Father, we thank you for your mercies and your, and, and your forgiveness, Lord, that you offer so freely. Father, as we come before you today, please, we, we offer up this sacrifice of praise before you, Lord. And our desire, Lord, is to lift you up and to give you glory and honor in everything that happens here today, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do. We welcome you among us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's praise him. Let everything that has breath, if you're here, you've got breath, let's give some praise. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise Let everything, let everything that, let everything that, let everything that. Soul. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your, your might, your and your endless love, then surely we would never cease to pray. Everything that has 
praise you in the heavens, but join with the angels, praise you forever and a day. Worthy, hallelujah. Praise you on the earth now, joining creation, calling all the nations to your praise. But if we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope, it's in your name. And now my joy awaits my praise. Let's give it praise. Set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing.
praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, that your love was so abounding towards us, Lord, that you would come and give yourself for us. Thank you, Lord.
the work of the cross was more than enough. I've been set free. I've been set free. Sin has no hope. Shame has no power over me. Found in your mercy. set free. I've been set free. Oh, I've been set free. Thank you, Lord. Sin has no hope. Shame has no power. No power over me. Found in your mercy. I've been washed clean. You call me whole. Saved and set free yes you call me whole saved and redeemed i've been set free yes you call me whole saved and redeemed i've been set free hallelujah hallelujah yes lord yes lord we've been set free by the power of your blood hallelujah thank you lord Let's just worship him. If you have a need today, these altars are open. Come forward and let us pray with you today. In the meantime, let's just continue to worship and praise our God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Just sing his name. What a beautiful name. Jesus. precious name of Jesus. Jesus, oh Jesus, what a beautiful name, precious name of Jesus, my Every name 
human language And every sound that's whispered on the wind No other one could ever fill the emptiness inside Oh, 
I'm thankful for the blood. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. Oh, I am thankful for the blood of Jesus. I am thankful for your blood of Jesus. It washes.
mercies. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, the words don't do justice to what you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that's here among us, Lord. We give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Isn't it great being in the Lord's presence? Amen. A couple of announcements to take care of here. Um, uh, the men's breakfast will be uh, next Saturday, uh, January the 6th, 2024, at 10 a.m. over in the Mission House next door. I uh, hope uh, you guys are, will be able to, to join us. Um, as pastors mentioned the last couple of weeks, uh, we're coming around time near to the uh, business meeting, which will be in March, I believe, this year. But in preparation for that, we need to have some uh, nominating ballots uh, to assemble the names uh, that will be on the ballot uh, to, for, for board members um, at, this, at this business meeting. Uh, those nominating ballots will be available the next two Sundays, not today, but the next two Sundays. Uh, if you're a member, you need to turn them in by Jan January the 14th, uh, and the instructions will be on the ballot as to what you need to do, the names you need to fill out and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> Christmas decorations, which are still up, we're going to need some help. Um, uh, taking these down, uh, that is scheduled for Saturday the 13th at 10 o'clock. So any folks that can come and help us de-decorate the sanctuary, we'd uh, appreciate a few extra hands. Um, the one-to-one -one ministry network uh, that we're trying to put together to minister to folks, uh, provide uh, care and attention and mentoring uh, to them, uh, that's still something that we're trying to build. If you're interested in joining the team, uh, there will be a meeting in the fellowship hall downstairs uh, for about 10 minutes after the service on January the 21st. So it's still a couple weeks away uh, to get that in, in your minds, thinking about if you're able to be here, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, ushers, if you'd go ahead and come forward. Uh, we're going to prepare uh, to have our offering. Uh, thank you so much for the financial support that you've sowed into this fellowship. That it's enabled us to do the things that we do and to reach out to, to folks and to minister to them. Uh, we appreciate your ongoing faithfulness. Um, so let's go to the word. Go to the go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day again. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit, Lord, that's been among us. And Father, we pray for this this offering as we as we take up this this offering, Lord, that uh, you would bless the giver and bless the gifts, Lord, that will enable us to to continue to minister to those around us, Lord, in your name, lifting up. You, lifting up the name of Jesus to this neighborhood and, and the people around us, Lord, whether it's at work, uh, wherever we go, Lord, everybody here, Lord, has a different sphere of people that we can minister to and touch, Lord. Use us as your instruments, Lord, to bring glory and honor to your name. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and as I've already said, uh, Pastor Danny's on vacation, so... Uh, today we have Bill Gallus that will be with us. He's been with us before. He was actually on staff here a number of years ago, along with his wife Mary. So we're excited uh, to have you back, Bill. And um, let's see what the Lord's going to do. Amen. Is that good? Can you hear me now? Well, it, this is kind of like uh, home to us uh, for Mary and I. Uh, some of you already know us. Some of you are just meeting me and Mary for the first time. Uh, this is uh, oh, Bethel's special place for us. Uh, this is where we got filled with the Holy Spirit right here in this sanctuary uh, where God began his call on my life under the ministry of Pastor uh, Sheraton. Uh, went off to Bible college, uh, preparing for ministry, came back and was involved in ministry, actually was on staff here at, at Bethel. I always like to point to that little room there. That was my office. I'm told don't look in there. <laughs> it's, 
probably full of a, a lot of uh, stuff which churches gather up. And so, yes, it's a special place. Been in the ministry now for over 40 years. Uh, Semi-retired, as I was sharing with uh, Aaron, that uh, you never really retire when you're in ministry. You never do. And as Christians, you really never uh, retire of uh, being a light to this world. So, yeah, so uh, it's given us the opportunity to, to uh, speak at other churches. We were on staff at Walnut Grove Assembly of God there for 26 years, which is in the uh, West Mifflin area of Pittsburgh. Uh, not only is Bethel sort of a homey place for us because of its influence in our Christian past, but it's home in our neighborhood, too. We grew up here. I grew up, my wife grew up uh, up on Dunlap Street, up uh, on Perrysville Avenue. I grew up on Federal Street Extension on the north side. And we still live here in Brighton Heights. Uh, I could probably walk to this church. If I had a bicycle, it would take me about two minutes to get here. So it's sort of nice. Uh, going to West Mifflin took about a half hour. It's nice to just kind of roll out of bed, right? And you can be at church. So, uh, But this has been an exciting year uh, for me and Mary. This is our first year, like, called full retirement or semi-retirement. And, and uh, God has done some special things uh, in my life. And, and uh, one of the things started about uh, three years ago during COVID. Remember COVID? Remember that horrible time, 2020? Uh, lockdown, businesses closed, restaurants were closed, nowhere to go. Uh, we were working from home for the first time. And a lot of you still didn't go back to work. You're still working remotely. And, and so it was during that time that, uh, you know, we were doing church services remotely. And so I was at home all the time. And, and uh, I, I started to become interested in the Civil War. And in particular, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, because I had a lot more time on my hand being at home. I became fascinated with that the story of that that time in our country's history, back in the 1860s, and in particular the the leader who who led during that horrible time, where over 630,000 men died. Imagine that, 630,000 men died in four years. And on top of that, millions were wounded. We could use a man like Abraham Lincoln again. And it was during that time I started to write. I didn't know I was going to become a writer, but I began to write. And uh, that writing turned into a book. And I have it in the back for you who are interested in buying it. I called it Lincoln's Ghost. It's in the back. And the reason I call it Lincoln's Ghost because uh, his words still speak. His words still speak. And how many of you know the voice of God still speaks? And that's why I want to really want to talk to you this morning is about the voice of God. Because we need to hear the voice of God. That was a terrible time in our nation's history. Bloody. Divided. A divided country. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? A divided country. An angry country. That's what it was during Lincoln's time. That's what it is during our time. And so, let's pray. Take a moment and just ask, Lord, we, you don't need my voice, church. You don't need my voice. You need the voice of God. You don't need my words. You need the word of God. You don't need my energy and my passion. We need the passion and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I ask that you would do that. 
that, Lord, you would just surround us with your presence. You say we're two or more gathered in your midst. You said you would be with us and you keep your promises. And so, Lord, be in our midst. Speak to us. Take this time. Lord, maybe one word, maybe a sentence, maybe a verse. And would you stir it in someone's heart that, God, it would be remembered and it would bear fruit. So, Lord, we just give you the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a verse of scripture that it has been over these past few years, it, I guess I can use the word haunting me. And I find it more relevant than I ever have before. And that, that's a verse of scripture found in 2 Peter. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, I'll read it for you. But 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Lot. Lot. We know who Lot was, right? It said, Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from the day to day with their unlawful, sinful deeds. Now we know the story of Lot. He's in, he's in where? Sodom and Gomorrah, a wicked place. And there's an there's a old word there used, and I could have used the New American Standard or NIV, but I chose to read this in the King James because there's a word in the King James we don't use anymore. It's an old-fashioned word. It's called the word vexed. It said righteous lot sitting in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah, seeing what was happening every day, hearing the language Boy, our language changed, right? I don't even think there's any swear words anymore, right? There's not any swear words anymore. It's just common words. So here we have righteous Lot sitting in Sodom and Gomorrah, hearing filthy conversation, seeing the debauchery and the wickedness around him. And it said it's vexed his soul. Like I said, that's an old word. We don't use it anymore. Vexed. Let me give you the definition of it. It can mean troubled, upset, bothered. Troubled, upset, bothered. That's the, that's the, the mild translation of the word vexed. You know, we can be around something that upsets us, right? It bothers us. It annoys us. Well, vex can mean that. But there's a deeper, stronger meaning to the word vexed. And it's angered, enraged, fuming, furious. That's a better picture of Lot. He's sitting in the midst of a filthy land full of corrupt sexual debauchery. And not only bothered and upset him, it vexed him to the point that it angered him to see it. I'm finding that. I'm relating to that. At the direction of our country. At the direction of our culture. Of the direction of some churches. It vexes me. And it vexes God. So what's vex me? Angered. Furious, enraged. I have a question for us. You can answer in your own heart. You can say amen in your own heart. I have a question for our congregation. 
and not for just for you, but for me, all right? Here's the question. How many of you want to hear the voice of God? You want to hear the voice of God. And to know the will of God for your life. How many want to hear the voice of God and know his will? Well, I'm sure if you're sitting here this morning, that's a 100% yes. But I'm going to tell you something this morning, church. There's a big difference between hearing the voice of God and being the voice of God. And that's primarily what I'm going to talk about this morning, about being the voice of God. I said as I was reading during the COVID times and trying to put together this book about Abraham Lincoln, I started to see in that war and his words, I started to see, you know, God was saying something through that war. God was saying something through that president. And so I made a devotion out of that. So that's what the book's about. It's actually a, a devotion that you read every day. And I kept thinking, boy, we need to hear the voice of God. And not only hear the voice of God, to be the voice of God. Because there are times Lincoln was the voice of reason, the voice of freedom, the voice of justice. And I said it earlier, boy, we sure could use a man like Lincoln in the White House today. Amen. Or in Congress or in the Supreme Court, or in our local courts, or in our classrooms, in our schools, we could sure use a voice like that. I have another question for us. How many of you know there are lots of different voices in the world? Not just the voice of the Word of God, not just the voice from the pulpit, but there's lots of voices out there. There's voices in the arena of government. They're shouting loudly. There's the voice of academia. I'm ashamed sometimes of the things I see allowed in our schools, in our universities. I'm ashamed. But those voices in our colleges, in our universities, in our high schools, in our elementary schools, are speaking loud. There's voices. Government speaking loudly. Culture. It's the most embarrassing as a Christian to turn on a television. To even look at the, at the internet and know, know what's going to pop up on that. It's embarrassing. It's enraging. It's angering. It's vexing. I just want to say this, lest I bum everybody out. <laughs> Fear not. Because there's a passage of scripture and I want to read with it you. Psalms, I'd like you to go to Psalms, chapter 2. And when I read Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it reminds me of what's going on in our world right now. It says, why do the heathen rage? That's verse 1, chapter, Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? Let me tell you, you don't rage silently. You don't rage silently. You rage silently. Loudly, vocally, powerfully. So the question there is, why are the heathen, the unbeliever, the unsaved, so angry? And the people imagine a vain thing. They're coming up with a lot of nonsense in this world. 
And then it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Doesn't it sound like today? The leaders, the rulers, the kings, they take their stand. They take their counsel against God. And it specifically says his son is anointed. It's the news today, folks. This is the news today. We read it every day in the paper of some law that is contrary to the word of God. Some cultural shift that would embarrass your parents, your grandparents years ago. And now the world's taken it as normal. There is a diabolical, devilish, demonic agenda. That's what they say. That the kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers counsel against who? Against who? Against God and his son. And why are they doing that? Kind of answer the question in verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? And why they imagine such a vain thing? And why are they fighting against God? It gives you the answer in verse 3. It says, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. This world does not want to obey God. This world wants to do its own thing. Law after law in our government that was based on the word of God is being torn down, being cast aside so men and women can say, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. Those verses read like today's paper and sadly tomorrow's paper but I said lest I leave you bummed out and discouraged because that is not my intention verse 4 says something powerful in that psalm it said here the heathen are raging they're wanting to break loose from the restraints of God and it says that God sits and what's he do he laughs. He laughs. Because <laughs> he looks down at this feeble attempt that we are, over gonna, we are going to overthrow the hand of God in this world. It just ain't going to happen, folks. <laughs> he says, he laughs. So I take harder than that and say, God, you got it under control, even though they're raging and complaining and changing things. At the heart of the matter is the voice of God and the way of God and the power of God, and it will be victorious. And they are like fleas compared to a giant. And the Lord laughs at their foolishness. So lots of voices out there. Lots of voices. And they're loud. And they're persistent. <clears throat> I read a story once about the story of Barabbas and Jesus. We know who Barabbas was. He was a criminal. He was captured. And he was imprisoned at the same time as Jesus. Remember that story? Yes. And under Roman law, they allowed for a prisoner, one prisoner, be set free and their sentence commuted to kind of appease the people. And so here you have Jesus and here you have Barabbas and you have Pilate who's in control of things. And he says to the people, who do you want me to set free? I'll set free one of them. It can be Barabbas. It can be this Jesus. And we know the story, right? They cried out, give us Barabbas. And I read this book on that story once, and the disciples said, why would they set Barabbas free and not Jesus? And the word came back, because the people for Barabbas shouted louder. 
They <laughs> shouted louder. The world has a voice. And it's loud. And it's persistent. Every day we're hit with it. In the news, in our schools, on television, on the internet, we're pounded with the loud voice of the world. Why aren't we shouting back? What's the church to do? If the world is shouting loud, then what should we be doing? We should be shouting back. It says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, it says this. Jesus says to the disciples, what I tell you in darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout it from the housetops. Jesus telling his disciples, what I've told you, what I've shown you, don't keep it quiet and don't whisper it. Shout it. Because the world needs to hear. You know, sometimes when you got someone who's really loud and obnoxious, you know what you have to do? You got to shout over them. You got to raise your voice to their level and above. I've been looking over these past years, 2020, 2021, 22, and now 23 is at the end. And we see the voice of the world is getting louder. And I say, well, what is my responsibility as a, as a Christian, as a Christian man? Not, not as a pastor, as a, as a Christian man. What is my responsibility? What is your responsibility as a Christian woman out there to do? There's a passage in Daniel Chapter 11, verse 32. I'll read that one for you. It said, My people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Exploits are like mighty things, significant, powerful things. And I'm like, I read that verse. Over these past years, I said, God, I want to be strong for you. I want to do exploits for you. I want to make a difference. I'm 71. I don't know how much time I have left. I want to make a difference. I want to do something powerful for God. I want to shout above the crowd. I want to say there's a different truth to the truths, really lies, that the world is saying. I don't want my grandchildren to know the Lord. I want my great-grandchildren to know the Lord. I want my children to know the Lord. I want to be a voice. I want to do exploits. It's the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. So I have to be honest to myself and I have to ask you a question, church. What stops us? What's stopping us from shouting loudly? What's stopping you, me, from doing great exploits? If I am to shout truth from the housetops and I am to be strong and do exploits for God, and I said earlier, I said, boy, our politics could sure use a man like Lincoln. Well, our world, our community, Northside, Pittsburgh, could sure use a godly man and woman who will speak truth who will not compromise, who will be a light. 
Because the world needs us. Pittsburgh needs us. Northside needs us. But what's stopping us? What is stopping us from being the voice of God? Because remember, I said there's a big difference. Because when I ask you a question, how many of you want to know and hear the voice of God? We all say, yes! There's a difference between knowing the will of God, hearing the voice of God, and being the voice of God. So what's stopping us from being the voice of God? Let me give you some thoughts. Maybe we lack vision. Maybe we lack vision. I won't trouble you with reading the whole story, but I'll kind of paraphrase it for you. You have in Numbers that Moses sends out how many spies? Come on, it's Sunday school stuff. He sends out 12. 12 spies. They're getting ready to cross the Jordan, go in the promised land. They've been trudging around in the wilderness for 40 years. It's time to go to the place that's been promised to them. So they send out 12 spies. And they spy around and they come back. And here's their report. Ten of them give this report. There's, many, there's too many people there. They got mighty armies. Their men are big. They're like giants. Their cities are fortified and walled. As a matter of fact, when we looked at them, they made us feel like grasshoppers. I think that's an interesting part of that story. It didn't say that the giants said they were grasshoppers. They said in our own eyes, we felt like grasshoppers. Maybe that's the problem with us, church. We see ourselves as grasshoppers. We're not grasshoppers. We're mighty men and women of God. We're children of the Most High. We're saved. We're redeemed. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Word of God that proclaims, that can break strongholds. That's who we are. But maybe, just maybe, we don't see ourselves like that. Maybe we look at ourselves as we have nothing to say. How can we beat the fortified walls and the tower of lies that are in this world? We're just nothing but little people having a church service on Sunday. We lack vision. And when you see yourself as weak, you're going to act weak. When you see yourself as insignificant, that's how you're going to look in your own eyes. But we need some vision, folks. We need to see who we are in God. And here's another reason. Maybe we aren't being the voice of God. We should, maybe we don't ha have the passion. Maybe we're just not excited. There's an interesting story. It's in the book of 2 Kings. It's a prophet, Elisha, is about to die, and he goes to King Joash, and King Joash is kind of upset because Elisha is this powerful figure in Israel, and you know he, he, he does miraculous things, but Elisha is an old man now, and he's getting ready to die. And Joash comes at a to uh, the prophet, and he's just terrified. He said, what are we going to do without you? We're surrounded by enemies, and when we had you, we had something. Now you're going to be gone, and we're going to be helpless. And So he, he's feeling threatened and weak, and, and Elisha says to Joash, he said, I want you to take an arrow and put it in a bow. You can read it for yourself. It's in 2 Kings. I think it's... Uh, in chapter 13, 2 Kings chapter 13, it says, take this arrow, shoot it out the window. Shoots it out. He said, you're going to defeat your enemies. Just like this bow. Just like that arrow shot. He said, you're going to take down your enemies. And then he says to him, he said, I want you to take a, 
a group of arrows and hold it in your hand. And he holds it in hand and he says, I want you to beat the ground with it. He beats the ground three times. And Elisha's mad. He said, you should have beat it five or six or seven times. Only three. Now you're only going to feed your enemy three times. And I already read that story. And that story was confusing to me. Because Elisha didn't tell him how many times to beat it. He just said, take these arrows, beat the ground with it. And that's exactly what the king did. Now the prophet's upset with him. Say, because you didn't beat it six or seven times, you're not going to have a complete victory over your enemy. And I was always looking at it and said, but you didn't tell him to beat it six or seven times. You just said, hit the ground. But there's something we're missing in that story. We're missing a heart that lacked passion. I'm going to tell you, when you're angry, have you ever been angry and pounded something? Ever been that angry? No one has to tell you how many times you pound that desk or kick that wall or punch in that wall or stomp your feet or shut. No one has to tell you, give you direction because it is welling up from inside you. Maybe, folks, the reason we're not the voice of God is we don't have any passion. We're just not excited. We're just, you know, remember I gave you that definition of vexed? Bothered, annoyed, upset. There's not much passion to be annoyed, upset. But man, when you are enraged, furious, fuming, <laughs> something's welling up within you. Folks, maybe the reason the world is running over us is because we've lost our passion. We've lost it. Let me give you one more. Maybe we're just plain procrastinators. Putting things off, right? Isn't that procrastination? You say, I'm going to do this, and you never get around to it, okay? You, for your own time, you can look. There's a, there's a passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 9 where this unknown disciple says, hey, I want to follow you, and Jesus says, okay. I just want you to know something. Uh, the foxes have their dens, the bird have their nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. So that means when we're going out, there's going to be no Eaton Parks and no Hilton Hotels. You know what? You never hear from that disciple again. Then there's another disciple that comes up to him and says, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus. And Jesus says to him, then come and be my disciple. And he said, but first I got some things to take care of. I got to go home, you know, make matter, you know, get, get things in arrangement. My father's not dead yet, so I got to hang around until he passes away. And, you know, it's just not the right time. And, you know, we never hear from that disciple ever again. Because he said, I got some other things to do. I know this, I should be doing this, but I got some other things to do. What has God in our way? From serving God. What has God in our way? There's a saying that says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's a powerful word. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Man, I have wanted to do this. I said earlier, I'm 71. I got some things that God wants me to do. I don't think I have 20 years to do it. My getting around to it, times need to come to an end. Amen. Folks, am I just speaking to myself up here? Nope. The getting around to it stuff has to end. Amen. 
What causes our voice to be silent? Maybe we're just not convinced. I want to show you a clip here in a second, video clip. Like I said, during those COVID times, and it caused me to write a book. I read more about the Civil War. I read more about Abraham Lincoln. I read about the, the personalities and the people involved in that time period. And I came across this letter from a man named Sullivan Ballou. <clears throat> Solomon Ballou is a major in the Union Army. He's getting ready. It's a few days before a major battle, the second battle of Bull Run. <clears throat> He's getting ready to go to battle, so he writes a letter to his wife. And that letter has been recorded and saved. And there's some things in this letter I think can speak to us about needing to be a voice and maybe why we're not. So, Bonnie, could you show that?
There were some things in that letter that I'll just point out, remind you of. Why would this man leave his lovely wife, he volunteered, and his children to go fight in a war that he could get out of? He says that he was confident of the cause. He believed in the cause. Maybe that's part of what drove him to leave the comfort of home and his wife and his young boys because he believed in the cause. Maybe we don't speak loud enough because we are not convinced of the cause. <clears throat> he said he believed he needed to go because he believed what he was doing, the country needed him. Maybe we don't speak loud because we believe this old country is just going to tick along No, this old country is headed to hell. But I want to take some people to heaven. He said the reason he did it is he felt a great debt to those who have gone before him. I have a debt. I owe a debt to Jesus Christ. I owe a debt to the prophets and apostles that went before me. I owe a debt to the pastors and the Sunday school teachers who spoke into my life. I owe a debt, and you owe a debt to the men and women who loved the Lord, who spoke the voice of God to generations before. We owe a debt to them to not give up. And he said he was willing, perfectly willing to lay down all this world's joy to pay that debt. That meant leaving his wife, possibly not seeing his children grow up. <clears throat> he loved his wife, but he loved something greater. And he said it was like a great wind came upon him and pulled him to the battlefield. God. Please give us that wind again. Please. That will pull us from our procrastination and our lack of vision and looking down on ourselves and missing who we are in Christ. Lord, let that wind of your Holy Spirit please pull us again. Because church, the world needs our voice. Pittsburgh needs our voice. Northside needs our voice. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren need us to shout. Could I have the worship team come? I didn't keep track, <clears throat> Joe. That second song you sang, could we do that? <laughs> We're going to do Grateful. Grateful. Mm -hmm. It's a song I sang. 
I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but I am going to ask you to stay seated. But if that wind of the Holy Spirit is tugging at you, then I'm going to ask you to come to the front. No guilt. No intimidation. Just let if the wind of the Holy Spirit is pulling you to the front. And then we'll pray together. is the day you have made whatever comes I won't complain for all my hope it's in your name and now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks for all you have done and I will sing of your mercy and your Set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness is my solid rock. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am great. I give thanks for all you have done And I'll not forget all the battles you have won Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful As I lift And as we lift our is the day that you have made whatever comes I won't complain for all my hope it's in your name and now your joy awaits my praise and I give thanks for all you have done and I will sing of your mercy and your unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. I give thanks for all you have done. I won't forget all the battles you have won. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. If I can give one mind, I'd like to change your word. Says with our hands lifted up, mm -hmm. can we just make with our voices lifted up? Because when our voice is lifted up, the heavens do open. Amen. When we speak the truth of God, when we declare the word of God, when we're bold in the word of God, to the heavens do open. Angels are sent forth. Strongholds are broken. Hearts are grabbed and grabbed. So can we sing it that way? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hey. 
And as we lift our voices, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we lift our voices, the heavens open, heavens not be a loud voice. You know that? You know, they, one of the disciples said to his, the friend, his friend, we find the Messiah. He's born in Nazareth. And I think it was maybe Nathaniel that said can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And the word back was just this. Come Let's and see. see. It's not about the, the volume. It's about the power in the word. Mm -hmm. Come and see. Maybe we said that more often rather than arguing in that convoy he said, you know what? You need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man who puts his trust in him. I'm reminded of a great argument in Scripture where a man is born blind and Jesus heals him and the blind man is taken in front of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, 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 the religious officials and said, how would you become How'd you, how'd you become, uh, get, gain your sight back? And he said, well, Jesus did. And they said to him, we know this man cannot be from God. And they argued theologically on why he can't have done what he did. And just in a calm voice, this man says, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. But this one thing I know, I was once blind. And now I see. There's power in the Word. Yes. It's not the volume. It's not stamping our feet. But it is being willing to speak. I have a beautiful memory of my grandson. He was three years old. We were visiting him. They live out in Arizona. He's 10 years old now. I was visiting him and three years old. He's laying on my chest with his head on my chest. And I'm just having one of those warm moments of a grandfather and a grandson. And he says to me, Grandpa, I love you. In a little soft voice, Grandpa, I love you. 
And I said to him, Noah, why do you love Grandpa? And he said, because you're just so excited. <laughs> Those small, soft words, Grandpa, I love you, had more strength and more power and more volume than any of the greatest orator could say. Folks, quit looking at yourself as little. You're not grasshoppers. You're mighty men of God. Amen. Women of God. You have a voice that can defeat the enemy. You have truth that can confound those who consider themselves wise. There is power behind your word because there is a God behind your word. And he knows how to break addictions, mm -hmm. how to break through the halls of Congress. That's our God. And so, Lord, we stand before you with the wind of your spirit drawing us to the battlefield. <clears throat> Forgive us for our procrastination. Forgive us for belittling ourselves because you made us and you don't make junk. Forgive us, Lord, for not having the passion to push and speak. Forgive us. But now that the forgiving is over, use us. Your blood washes away our sin. Thank you, Lord. But now that that's taken care of, use us. Use us in our city. Use us in our country. Use us in our family. We want to hear the voice of God. But we want to be the voice of God, too. So, Lord, we ask for your anointing on us to carry up on as we leave these doors. And Lord, may 2024, I don't know what it means for our country. I don't know what it means for our city. I don't know what it means for our world. But I want 2024 to mean something for me and you together doing something. God, no more laziness, no more procrastination, no more fear. Use us, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, church. Thank you for having us. Go to the Lord and Happy New Year to all of you, okay?